Well, thank you everyone for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Kim and I'm one of the event hosts here at Pals Books. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming events by visiting our website, pals.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is Kale Williams in conversation with John Mualam about Kale's new book, The Loneliest Polar Bear, a true story of survival and peril on the edge of a warming world. The events next Tuesday, or sorry, next Wednesday, the 24th. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome two Portland literary superstars, Whitney Otto and Lydia Yuknovich. Whitney Otto is the author of five novels, including the New York Times bestseller, How to Make an American Quilt, which was later made into a movie of the same name, and Eight Girls Taking Pictures. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and in several anthologies. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her family. In her new book, Art for the Ladylike, Otto limbs the lives of eight pioneering women photographers, Sally Mann, Imogen Cunningham, Judy Dater, Ruth Orkin, Tina Madotti, Lee Miller, Madam Yvonne, and Greta Stern to in turn excavate her own writer's life. The result is an affecting exploration of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be an artist, and the perils and rewards of being both at once. Ultimately, Otto ponders the persistent question that artistic women face in a world that devalues women's ambition. If what we love is what we are, how do those of us with multiple loves forge lives with room for everything? Joining Whitney Otto in conversation this evening is Lydia Yuknovich. Yuknovich is a nationally best-selling author of the novels, The Book of Joan, The Small Backs of Children, and Dora, A Head Case and of the memoir, The Chronology of Water. Her short fiction collection, Verge, was released in paperback last month, and her new novel, Thrust, is forthcoming from Riverhead. She's the recipient of two Oregon Book Awards and has been a finalist for the Brooklyn Public Library Literary Prize and the Penn Center USA Creative Nonfiction Award. She lives in Portland, Oregon, where she founded Corporeal, <laughs> Writing. Corporeal. Corporeal writing. Thank you, Lydia. A non-academic alternative for misfit writers and artists. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please be sure to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. If you want to know the answer to a question somebody has already entered, please use the thumbs up button to upvote that question. And please consider supporting Whitney and Pals by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy art for the ladylike will be shared in the chat a few times this evening. Whitney and Lydia, it's always a pleasure to welcome you back to PALS and thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you, Kim. Pleasure. So, <laughs> Lydia, I guess I'll start here. You start, beloved <laughs> Whitney. Okay, beloved Lydia, um, I just want to thank you, Kim and Powell's and and thank everyone for coming. And also thank you, Lydia, who human extraordinaire, writer extraordinaire. My pleasure. Um, and also to let you know that um, Lydia's story collection Verge is now out in paperback and do yourself a favor, it's great. Um, what else can I say? Okay, so what I was going to do is I'm going to show you a a fairly quick slideshow just to sort of orient you with the women. Um, and this book, I guess the only setup is it's, it's, I consider it my autobiography because with the idea that we are what we love, you know, we become the thing that, you know, are influenced by the things that we love. Um, it's also a companion piece to my novel, Eight Girls Taking Pictures. However, they stand completely alone. You don't need to read one and read the other, but they draw on the same source material, which was something that I had wanted to do. So it's sort of like a literary diptych. Um, the, the photographers in this book are, are not chosen because they're photographers. They're people, they're women who influenced me. So it's not a book about photography exactly. Um, in case anyone was wondering. Um, and they span the 20th century. Uh, half of them were born in the late 19th century. Judy Dater and Sally Mann are still working today in the 21st century. Um, the other thing I could say about photography is that women were in the profession from the beginning, 
but the difficulties that they faced weren't getting into it. It was being within it. And then finally, um, most of them had much stronger relationships with their fathers than with their mothers. And their fathers, generally speaking, were progressive toward their daughters, not always toward women in general, although some of them were, but, but they had that kind of relationship with their daughters, which allowed their daughters to, I think, try and have uh, you know, more non-traditional life. Um, and none of the fathers wished for them to be sons. They were not surrogate sons. They were definitely their daughters. So anyway, so I'm gonna start with this slideshow and then I'm gonna read something from the book, um, which I'll get to in a minute. And I'll show you the cover of the book because it'll relate to the slideshow. So here's the, the cover, which I really love. Um, and I'll start the slideshow. Um, uh oh, or maybe I won't start the slideshow. <laughs> there it is, okay. So it's art for the ladylike. Um, this is, men tell you the only important pictures are taken on the battlefield and they ban you from the battlefield. And that's Imogen Cunningham. This is Imogen Cunningham. Um, she was born in 1883 in Portland, Oregon, but she was largely raised in Seattle. Um, she was the first person in her family. She was from a, there were 10 kids in the family to graduate Whitney, from university. Yes. Whitney, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but your slideshow isn't um, visible to the audience. Oh no. Oh no. Okay, hold on. Sure. Oh wait, they'll be fine. Let me see. Wait, 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 wait. Why isn't it visible? Oh, I didn't do the sharing thing, maybe. Shoot. Okay, wait, hold on. Yeah. I'll, I'll get to this. Yeah. I will figure this out. We're okay. all used to it. There you go. Can you see it now? Yep. Yes. All right. Okay. So this is art for the lady like. There's the quote I just read. Right, right. Okay, now you can see it. Okay. So yeah. this is Imogen Cunningham. As I said, she was born in Portland, Oregon in 1883, raised in Seattle. First person in her family to graduate from uh, University of Washington in chemistry, because at that time you couldn't major in photography. This is one of her more famous pictures, although she's got quite a few. This is called Unmade Bed, 1957. It's one of my favorites. This is Ruth Orkin. Ruth Orkin was born in Boston in 1921, but she was mostly raised in Los Angeles, um, only child, and she was raised around the movie industry. This is her at 17 years old, and this little bike in it is when she rode from California to New York City on this bike by herself. And that was in the 1940s. This is one of her most famous shots, although she has a lot of them too. This is American Girl in Italy. And the <clears throat> woman in the picture is Jinx Allen. She was 24 years old. They met at this hotel in Florence and decided to do a photo essay of a woman traveling alone. Um, this was 1951. So this picture happened spontaneously and then it was set up. And I write about this in my book, which is why it's in there. This is Ruth Orkin um, after she got married and she and her husband had made a film called Little Fugitive, which Francois Truffaut said kicked off French New Wave. But after she got married and they had two kids, she was almost 40, she was home with the kids all the time. And they had an apartment on the 15th floor overlooking Central Park in New York. And because she was home all the time, she began taking pictures of the park. And it ended up being um, a series called A World Through My Window. And she did a second series too, which was more pictures from my window. And, and the first one came out in 1978. And for decades, she would shoot the, the park and the skyline and people in it and the changing seasons. And it, it's a really great series. And this is just one of the pictures oh. from that. This is Sally Mann. And Sally Mann is still working today. She was born in Lexington, Virginia in 1951. Um, she does a lot of really interesting stuff. She uses film, but she also uses glass plates. She likes damaged lenses sometimes with some of her work. Um, she does some things that are a little out there, like uh, she did a series of the body farm. The body farm was a place in Virginia where they take corpses and they, they strew them about so that people can study forensics. And she photographs dog bones, but she had a big controversy when she photographed her children growing up. And it was a series called Immediate Family in 1991. And this is one of the pictures from that 
uh, these are her two daughters. She had three children, two, two boys and a, uh, two girls and a boy. And this is called New Mothers 1989. This is Tina Modotti. And Tina Modotti was born in Italy in um, 1896. The family was poor, they were political. The father ended up emigrating to San Francisco and brought over the family eventually, which is when she came over. She ended up down in Los Angeles. Um, she was in silent films for a short time, but that's where she met Edward Weston. She wanted to go to Mexico City, which in the 1920s was like being in Paris in the 1920s or Harlem in the 1920s. It was just that sort of flowering of, of art and intellectualism and a kind of, kind of breaking in politically. She was communist. Um, and she has a really, really interesting life, I have to say. Um, this is one of her pictures. Um, and I really love this picture. I, I mean, one of my favorite pictures of her is of roses, but I really love it. And one other thing I can tell you about Tina Modotti, well, there's a bunch of things I could tell you, but one thing I can tell you is if you've ever saw seen Diego Rivera's The Chapel in Chapingo, and you see the, the picture of the naked woman and her hair is sort of falling like this, that's Tina Modotti. This is Lee Miller. Lee Miller, like Tina Modotti, was someone who was very beautiful. Um, she also made a couple of movies with, with uh, Cocteau. She was a model. She went to Paris and she hooked up with Man Ray and she was his lover and his assistant and his muse in the same way that Modotti was with Edward Weston. And this, the way that this looks, it's called solarization. And it happens when some light gets into the dark room and she says he discovered it. They sort of discovered it together. Um, anyways, but she was this great beauty. This is one of her pictures because she became a photographer. And this is during World War II in England. Um, it's called Fire Mask and it was during the Blitz. She ends up over on the continent at the very end of World War II and ends up with another photographer following the following the liberation of, of Europe and the camps. And she took a lot of pictures of the camps. And this is a picture of one of the men that she was traveling with who was also a photographer. This is Hitler's apartment. They went in the apartment, the phone was still live. As she said, I washed off the dirt of Dachau. Um, and she describes the apartment, which is really interesting. Um, but this was taken the day that Hitler committed suicide. Obviously not in the apartment. The woman on the left is Imogen Cunningham. The woman on the right is Twinka Tebow, who lives here in Portland, actually. And this is called Imogen and Twinka, Yosemite, 1974. Um, this is taken by Judy Dater. Judy Dater, I know, I'm not gonna remember her exact date. She was born in Los Angeles in 1941. I love this picture. I think it's great. I think it's a great image of, of age and youth and, um, I just like the contrast of it a lot. Um, so Judy Dater and her, the man who became her husband who is substantially older than she was and he had been her teacher, her photography teacher, they decided to do this series called um, Women in Other Visions where they would take pictures of the same woman but they wouldn't say it, who took it, like if it was a man or a woman who took the picture. And this is one of those from that series. And this is one is actually taken by Judy Dater and it's taken um, 1971 in, um, Berkeley, it's called Maria and Legend. And I think it's really beautiful. And one of the things I love about it, I think it's really classical. It's a very sort of classic, timeless mother and child picture that you see a lot in photography, even going back to someone like um, Julia Cameron or Gertrude Casimir. This is Mam Yavanda, and she was born in London at uh, the end of the 19th century. Um, opened up her own studio when she was 19 years old. And she did a lot, not a lot, but she did a handful of self-portraits. And this is one of my favorite ones. But the thing I love about Mam Yavanda is she worked a lot with color and really highly saturated color. And her best work for me is Between the Wars. And she did this one series, 24 shots of titled and aristocratic women dressed up like um, goddesses. And the goddesses but they're, they're contemporary and they're, um, they're whimsical. And she was a hardcore um, suffragette, but one, like she says, she wasn't about to go into the street. She was kind of a whimsical sort of suffragette, which is kind of my kind of suffragette. 
this is one of the goddess pictures and this is uh, the queen of the Amazons. And this one you can't really see in its entirety, but it's really amazing. This is also one of the goddesses. This is Medusa and you can't see, but the, the background is a hot pink and it glows. And then she put rhinestones all over the rubber snakes and the model's eyes, well, she's not a model, she's a, she's modeling, but she's an aristocrat. She has these sort of deep violet eyes, but all of them are just great. Like you'll see Athena and she's wearing a Nazi helmet and she's got a Luger and she's got a stuffed owl, or you'll see Aristhusa in a, in a, you know, a, like a $5,000 Fortuny gown. So there's a lot of playing with it, but very women centric. This is Greta Stern and Greta Stern was born in Germany um, in 1904. She and her partner, Ellen Auerbach opened up a photography studio. Um, and this again was during the Weimar Republic and they, um, when, when photography was starting to kind of move away from drawings and into more photographs and they got awards, but then of course the war came, she ended up marrying someone from Buenos Aires, ended up in Buenos Aires. And between 1948 and 1952, this magazine, which was kind of like a ladies home journal called Adilio, asked housewives to send in their dreams to be interpreted by their um, columnist who was a psychiatrist, but really it was these two men. And they asked Greta Stern, to make visual interpretations of the dreams. And so she did all these collages. And for me, I think they're one of the absolute best records of mid 20th century housewife female anxiety. And this is one of them. I mean, there's a lot of them, you should, they're great. There's another one, a woman is a paintbrush be, painting her own walls. <laughs> and then this one is, the jacket of my book. This is called Electrical Appliances for the Home. And of course you see the man switching her on and off. And so that's, whoops, that's my slideshow. <laughs> um, let me see if I can get back here. So that was really quick, I know. Um, there's a lot to say about the women, but all the women I showed you in the pictures are all in my book. I mean, not the, you know, I mean, they're not reproduced in my book, but but there's a lot more to say about these women and they all have just these extraordinary lives. And all, then it's mixed in. All of them, they're like their life stories and what happened to them and how they emerged inside their own art. They're all so fascinating. I just wanted to read and read. I wanted whole books about each of them because you made them so interesting. Um, but that wasn't fast. It was just amazing. I love looking at those. Oh, good. <laughs> Everybody does. I'm sure they do. So Whitney, oh my God, I have 10,000 questions, but I'll just ask you a few. And if you have questions, oh, humans out there in the ether, um, put them in the Q&A box. Um, but let me ask you first, Whitney, can you talk briefly about, you know, wh why photography is so, um, you know, inspirational, important to you, and 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 what, why you gravitate toward visual art and photography? Um, what is it about it that captures your imagination so? You know, I started this one project, kind of my like a memoirish thing, mm -hmm. in the late '90s, and and in part, I was thinking a lot about what it means to be a creative woman in a creative field. Yeah, and and I thought, oh, you know, I should look at. The, the people that I've loved since I was really, really young. And it just happened that a number of them were photographers. But when I think about photography as a writer, I think that there's a lot of similarities in that it can be something you do for hire. It can be just reporting. It can be journalistic. It, it can also be an art form. It can elevate in, in ways and places you don't expect. And so I think there's some kind of, and it's very observational, obviously. Yes, you know? yes. So. I think there's something that that is very writerly within it, in a sense. And I think it's also really interesting in that we, and I talk about this in the book, we look at a photograph and unless it's really abstract, we expect to be able to understand it right away because it looks like our world. Right. But the photographs that really resonate are the ones that are a story or a piece of a story or a mystery. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, they, they look like they should be our world and they're not. There's something that just grabs you. And, and uh, maybe you have questions. Yeah. Or, 
or touches or tickles a desire or a, a strong feeling you have, the ones that, that bring narrative to the surface of your viewing experience, um, all of the people you chose do that. And, and it's true for me too. I also love abstract photography for the same reason, because you can't come at it with just, oh, it's my world. You, you're sort of put in the, the position of dreamscape or surrealism or something. But, but that, that's interesting what you say. It is an observational mode. It's yeah. a capture the story mode. I, I see exactly what you're saying. And it is a little bit like writing, even though they're really different too. I, I, it's funny, like a, a writer, as writers, I mean, we're observing everything, but we're more surreptitious, I think. But with, with a photographer, it's one of the only times a human being gets to stare at another person without it being aggressive in a way, although it can be kind of aggressive, but you know what I mean? It's like, I think how great that you get to, <laughs> you get to just, you know, oh no, just, just taking pictures. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not staring at you. <laughs> Good point. You can be the voyeur and, and, and mm -hmm. not, not, you know, kind of get away with it unless it's transgressive and terrible, but you could stand in the position of the voyeur and people will let you, often people want you to. <laughs> um, yeah. But so when I'm reading the book, one of the other things I truly love about the reading experience is that you thread your life yeah. and your being an artist and a, and a, you know, in relationships and motherhood through the stories of these other incredible women who also had to navigate, <clears throat> I guess one word for it is domesticity. Yeah know navigating the roles of women as they're as they come at us and we inhabit them and embrace them or reject them or whatever um <clears throat> but your life threads through there too and so <clears throat> really exciting to read which is why you should all go buy the book this very night um and read it also tonight um can you talk a little bit about that relationship of putting your life and the telling of your story you know, threading it or weaving it, it and why you did that or what, what use value it is for you? I think, like I said, <clears throat> I was kind of at an impasse in my life. And I, and I just started thinking about these women. I thought, well, how did they do it? And of course, what you realize, and, and, and I say this at one point in the book too, is that you feel like you're doing both things at once, but really you're doing them so quickly. It almost seems like you're doing them at the same time because it's really hard to do all of it. And I think for the creative woman or even a woman in any kind of career that's not a job, but mm -hmm. is a career like a passion for her, um, it's it's hard because your your domestic life competes with that. and. And you really have like almost uh, too much love instead of thinking, oh, you know, this kid is crying. Oh, I got to go take care of this. You're thinking all I want to do is be with my child. But all I want to do is be with my book. But all I want to do is be with my inner life. And so and I and I talk about this, too, that sometimes I think with domestic work, like domestic fiction or domestic pictures, it can be sort of pushed aside like, OK, you know, like all right, it's not important work. It's not like you're on the battlefield. Um, but at the same time, as I say, sometimes the struggle of it is the book itself or the picture itself and the, and the fight to get that done. And, um, and there's a lot of things that keep women in that, that funny space. And, and some of it is just sometimes internally we're our own, you know, worst enemy where we think, oh, we have to do this, we have to do that. And, um, I mean, I talk at one point about how women, most women, I shouldn't say all, but they won't think to like sort of dump all the domestic stuff on their partner, if their partner's male, um, because they don't like it. But a male partner might not think twice about it. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't occur to them. <laughs> and I'm going to leave my husband out of this. I know. So, so it's kind of different. Well, and it's funny right for me. Now, but I'm not going to say any of them. <laughs> it does bring me to another kind of question. Um, and the, I'm going to go to some other people's questions too. But this one kind of dovetails with what you just said. You said a fascinating thing earlier about kind of about um, these women 
photographers and their relationships to their mothers and these women photographers and their relationship to their fathers. And then some of them were lovers of famous men artists of one sort or another. Um, can you talk a little bit about those kinds of relationships and um, not to analyze them, but like what's, what, what's, what are your thoughts about them? Well, a friend of mine who's a writer, Catherine Vaz, she just wrote me a letter recently saying that she'd read somewhere that um, the daughters of non-traditional fathers tend to be freer, but that the sons of non-traditional fathers tend to struggle. Oh, which, that's so interesting. Yeah. Do you, what do you think about that? You know, I think it could be true is what I think. It's because it's, it's a very... I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very strange setup if you have a household like that, um, you know, and I think with these women, like I said, with Imogen Cunningham, yeah. her parents had each been married before. She was the youngest of 10 kids, the only kid, child they shared. He had them in communes. He was like an animal rights guy. You know, he was very progressive, not, not well educated. He named her after a character in Shakespeare and everything, but, and even said, I don't know why you want to be a dirty photographer, but he built her a dark room. However, he was completely non-progressive toward his own wife. You know, with Imogen, it was like everything, but his own wife and women. And then you had someone like Mam Yvonne's father who uh -huh. owned, uh, he made inks, colored inks. And he wanted to set her up in her own um, studio right away. And he was, and both she and her sister were brought up with progressive schools. Everything was always very progressive for them. And then you have, Lee Miller, who had a relationship with her father that was um, dicey, to say the least. And I mean, no one knows if they were ever lovers or not, but there was certainly a lover-like element to their relationship, but she adored him and he adored, you know, and he, he made her life possible in so many ways. So, but it's a very thorny sort of relationship in there. That is so fascinating. I'm gonna go think about that for years, by the way. So thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a quite I see a question or two, and I don't want to hog everything. So was there one particular photographer in your book who you feel most resembles you or who you feel you identify with more than others or not? Um, you know, I mean, like not I mean, Imogen Cunningham a little bit with her marriage. I had a relationship earlier that wasn't unlike that. Um, and I think, um, you know, Tina Madotti, I, you know, I think well, I'm half Italian and, and I, you know, grew up in LA and, you know, so there's, a, so I, I feel like a little bit with her and, and as I write in the book, my, my little own dabbling with, you know, with, with politics and Marxism. Um, I don't really relate to um, Lee Miller because she's so, and her life is extraordinary. Her life up until age 40 is like a novelist dream. It's just extraordinary. Um, but I mean, she was painted by Picasso. She was, she was everyone's muse, but, but she's so beautiful. It's like, I always had like a crush on her, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I see Mary Engel is on, and I have to say that someone like Ruth, Ruth Orkin, Mary Engel is her daughter. Yeah. Um, I always wanted to meet Ruth Orkin <laughs> because I love her. I mean, I love this girl who hopped on a bike and, and rode across the United States. Cause I remember being in ninth grade and thinking, and I just gotten a new bike and I thought, oh, I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna ride like an hour away. And by the time I went to sleep, I had myself taking my bike and riding to New York City. <laughs> and I don't even know why, but I just, an, an American girl in Italy is also a, was an aspirational photograph for me when I was young. And I, and I, I just, I'm really attached to it and her in that way. God, but I love Mimi Bond, you know, she's my kind of feminist. She's my I feminist. hear you, like yeah. the phenomenal imagination leap mm -hmm. that she represents. And that if you never hear that story and you're growing up girl or boy or, or non-gender gender binary, and you hear that story, it's like something pops in your imagination, like you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> like that's even a possibility. But I feel that way about all the all the women artists who have influenced me. It, it made an imagination pop for me. Um well, who I, are some of your heroes? You. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean real heroes. Like like No, no, no. We're saying <laughs> you can't squirrel out of this. I see two oh. different ones. One is um 
what was your biggest takeaway after researching all of these amazing women's lives? Um, like, is that? Well, what I wanted to do, I mean, because I started this book uh, right before I started the novel all those millions of years ago. Um, and I knew at the time, I just wanted to talk about pieces of their lives. I didn't want, I wasn't a biographer. I just wanted to look at, there would be one thing in their life that I thought, oh, this is what I want to examine, or that's what I want to examine, because there are some really great um, biographies about them or documentaries. I mean, there's other information, which is really well researched. And I just wanted the thing that appealed to me, like with Mamia Yavanda, I love her her work between the wars. And I love that she is this whimsical suffragette. And I love that she says, yeah, you know, I just wasn't going to go and chain myself to anything because I'm kind of a, a watcher. I'm kind of someone who hangs in the tree and goes, I'm behind you, but I'm not going to be in the street with you. And, and I thought about that too. Um, you know, I got into feminism um, when I was in high school. And I talk about this in the book and reading Jermaine Greer when, you know, uh, um, the female eunuch and being, you know, I, you know, I came of age in the early, the very early 1970s. I know that I look like I'm 29, but you know, <laughs> but anyways, and it, and it was just so, it was, there was so much that was so radical. And then I got in this women's consciousness raising group and, <laughs> and they were just like, you know, I, I just knew I wasn't going to be like that kind of feminist. I was going to be like the backfield feminist, you know, it's like I was going to, you know, be there and be there and, and support you and, and you know, and, and be kind of immovable in my own way. But I, but I just thought I, it was going to be very hard for me to be a leader in a sense, because, because um, like Mamie Yvonda, it just, something struck me as funny. And you really can't be funny if you're, you know, fighting for your life. <laughs> People don't appreciate it. It's, it's an, it's an odd thing. <laughs> so well, another um, thing that happened to me while I was reading it is that each of their stories of their lives and the stories of your life was like a different angle on, on like one woman. Like we all have mm -hmm. all these people in us. We all have this polyphonic experience inside us and it was getting to look at the little pieces of ourselves and we maybe step into one or two or three or four but we have a bunch more still in us in our bodies and photography lets you show an array you know of mm -hmm. the identity pieces and your book does that too um this is a great sky style question um, oh, well, I'll read the whole thing. Your style figures very strongly in this book, the way you bring up people and places and artistic movements and your life. They interweave and overlap and come into and out of focus and then they pop up again. Can you talk about the development of this style and why you chose it to write this book? Do you know what he means by that style? In real life, I'm very digressive. <laughs> As anyone who knows me. <laughs> and John's always going, style. <laughs> I know, it's my style. John's always saying, edit, edit. And I'll start on a path and then I bring in something else and something else. And it's all gonna, it all matters to me because it's gonna make this, this point. And then I, and if you stick with me long enough, I will circle back. There is a method, you know, it's not just, it's not just, oh, you know, I have ADD or something. I, I have something that really, it, this relates to this, relates to this, relates to this. And so, I think that this book um, has that style, but I should also say that when I when I started writing, like decades ago now, um, the first short stories I wrote were um, were very collage like, and I was told at that time they go, oh, you know, you're you're a collagist, and I thought, I guess that's what I would call it. I don't know why the impulse was there to write out of order or in pieces or digressively. It just it just was, and I tried to write in a, you know, in a straighter way, and it. I just had a hard time with it, and, and with my first novel, I mean, it's a literary quilt. It's it's literally pieces right. that are stitched. I kept thinking of uh, threads, or another word that came to mind was prism, but threads mm -hmm. more so because, like the question, I saw threads that would come and then weave into something else and then come back around. And it remind me of other books of yours. So I know, I know yeah. what you're talking about. It's quite beautiful and it's non-linear, but the threads all 
create a gestalt in the end. They make form by coming in and out of each other. Absolutely. And I thought a lot about Sontag when I was reading. Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I, I, I like her well enough. I don't know that I would hang out with her, but <laughs> she seemed a little formidable. <laughs> I'd probably pee my pants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, you know that um, essay on photography and and her books on on mm -hmm. the position of the viewer and art and the critic and and I kept it kept coming up in the back of my mind. Um, wait, hold on. Peter wants to know. Um, I'll pretend I don't know you. Do you take pictures, or has all this work changed your own photography? Um, oh, I'm 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 horrible. I mean, I've always been like. It, I mean, this is the thing that amazes me about about film, and and I talk about this in the book, is that it's it's like the biggest artistic act of faith to think that what you're seeing is what will come up when you're in the dark room. And of course, we don't have that now because you know we take pictures in a different way, and you know, and it, and it just amazes me. But I don't, you know, my dad bought us. Um, <laughs> these dollar Diana cameras when we were children at Thrifty Drug. We were going on vacation. He bought all three of us these cameras. And yeah. I still have those pictures I took when I was a kid. They're of Disneyland. So they're just fascinating, of course. And then when I was 12, I wanted a Kodak Instamatic with the, with the spinning cube. Yeah. And I got one of those and I was so excited. But I never thought about being a photographer. That wasn't, I just didn't think I was good enough. Well, I wasn't good enough, but, um, but I, just, I just loved, I just loved photography so much and I thought, but yeah, it doesn't really change anything. I mean, I take pictures with my phone, but usually when I take pictures, it's just to mark something to write about later. I, I, I mean, um, I'm mu much more, nobody ever believes me when I say this, but I'm much more influenced by painting and painters than I have been by writers. Yeah. I paint, but I'm not a painter. I'm not good at it. And I'm not, you know, it's not something I want to be in the world as because I would die of humiliation. But the impact of visual art and painting upon me as a writer is just enormous. I would absolutely, if I was writing a companion book to go alongside yours, it would be about painters for similar reasons, for sure. Well, what, I mean, like, what is this always in your life, or was it something yep, that you yep, doing? yep. And I wanted to be, it corresponds to your story in that as a kid, I wanted to be a paint, painter. Um, yeah. And then the story gets sad because my dad kind of wrecked it for me. So we'll just leave that over there. But it stayed alive in me, and, and I gravitated toward it as meaningful, as inspirational, as life force, as erotic. And it's still true, like painting is it for me. And everybody's always like, well, what are your favorite novels right now? And I'm like, well, <laughs> just name some novels, Lydia. <laughs> I know. Um, here's a good one. Um, can you talk about the decisions you made about fictionalizing actual events and people and what you decided to write as nonfiction and how those overlap in the two books? Well, I started the essays first and then I thought, I thought, you, you come up, each, each form has its own limitations and its own sort of glories, right? So that's when I started thinking, I want to use the same source material and do a, a novel. And with the novel, I felt freer to make things up. You know, if I wanted to, you know, just go off the rails, you could do that. Mm -hmm. So the core is there, but there are just things that are invented. And I should say that I didn't write in the novel, I did not write about Sally Mann or Judy Dater. I didn't know enough about their lives to be able to do that. But what I was really attracted to in both of those uh, uh, women were specific pictures. So the immediate family series and um, the image in a Twinka picture. And so I used their series and the pictures, that was the nonfiction element in the novel with those two photographers. But the two photographers are, they're fictional. They're completely invented. We have a lot of things in common. I often invent a photographer in novels and uh, we have similar interests in the artists and photographers we love. And in my nonfiction, I often include a big swath of art making as the core theme. And like you, I like to, um, like, here's a way to ask this as a question. Why why not just write memoir and leave other women and their art out of it? Why not just Whitney all day, every page, all the time? 
Well, you know, I think, I think I, I, I don't think my life's very interesting. <laughs> I have to say, I don't think that there's enough, you know, kind of there. And my, my mother died recently, very recently. And when I wrote this book, she was still alive. And I thought, Ugh, you know, how much can I write about her? And, you know, and, and my brother is a, a pretty interesting fellow, but he is still alive too. <laughs> and so I, I felt kind of like, um, I think they're kind of two interesting things in my life, but I don't feel, I mean, I feel like I could write about her now, what's she going to do? But, you know, but I think, um, but, you know, you just always think, God, why didn't I run away and join the circus? Then I really have something to write about, you know, and my right. life just isn't, it isn't that eventful for, for good or bad, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's, so I think that I have to think of other ways to think about it or something. Well, I can tell you this from a reader perspective, and I bet I'm not the only one. When I'm sitting there reading it, I feel less alone as someone who's had to make the journey of how to be a woman artist in this stupid ass culture. <laughs> oh, good. How to navigate all relationships and ask questions about identity and still make art, you know, yeah. and choosing it. Um, I felt less alone. So, in that sense, you know, it becomes a vital kind of storytelling for people like me. And I'm positive I'm not the only one. Oh, God, thank you, Lydia. Well, that makes me feel very good, you know. <laughs> Told you I'm keeping that marriage offer in the back. <laughs> <laughs> New England, New England. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a, um, well, do you have a book coming in you that is still within this kind of material because it, it, I just keep thinking I could write about what you're writing about the rest of my life and be perfectly happy. <laughs> it, would just, <laughs> it would be enough to do fiction versions of it and then another nonfiction and then another fiction version and like I could do that's just such rich material. It really is and I think especially like when you talk about you know just feeling the way you feel about painting and everything you know, you really, when I started this, I thought, I'm just going to put in stuff I like to talk about. I was really talking to myself in a lot of ways. It's like, oh, I'm going to talk about this now. And I'm going to talk about that now. And I could see where if you feel about painting the way that I feel about photography, you do feel like I just want to talk about what I love about this. So I like, and I think that's the other thing too, is that so many books we don't allow ourselves always to write about what we love or about love. You know what I mean? I think we're, we wrestle with that. And this book for me was just, like I said, the bottom line of, of these women in their work. And, and I don't even know them. So they could be awful for all I know, but I love them, you know? So it, it was, it was a chance to write about love uh, in my own way. I think. That's a beautiful way to put it. It's kind of a little bit like a love letter then, isn't it? Yeah. You know, cause I, I just think they're so great. And also when I wrote this book and, and I did this with the novel at the back of the novel, I, I put in titles of books for people to look at. What I hoped would happen with the novel and with this book is that readers, if they become intrigued by these women, because I'm only showing a slice of their lives, yeah. they will go and they will pursue them, you know, and look at their work. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you that next. I was going to pretend that you, me and Karen Carbo are sitting and having wine in Collier right now. Yeah. And what I was going to ask you both is, do you think both of your books, because they have this in common, kind of slyly begin to both educate the reader about women that may have slipped their idea of history and also inspire them to go look up these women? I mean, how can the people listening not go look these women up now that the stories are too fascinating? Like, do you have an investment in that or does it just happen? And, and no. I think it's again, I think it's if you love something, and as I said, the photographers in there were meaningful to me. I didn't I didn't sit down and think I'm gonna write about photography. I just thought I'm gonna write about the creative life, but in a really, really personal way. And so because I, I love them and I get enthusiastic about them and their work, um, I'm always sort of hoping other people will, you know how you want to share something you love with other people. You're like, yeah, this is great, and that's great. And and um, 
And I mean, I don't, they don't need me, obviously. I mean, all of them are successful. It's not like they go, oh, thank God Whitney Otto came along <laughs> and gave me a little bump, <laughs> you know? Well, um, um, Catherine up here asked a question that relates to what you're talking about. Um, and the question Catherine asked is, do you need to ask the families of these women for permission to write about them? However, um, I, would, I would kind of bring something else to that question, which is, it's not like you're critiquing them or analyzing them. Yeah. You're mentioning pieces of their lives that you learned about and then were, you know, turned on by or lit up by. And so that's a different relationship than like, you know, needing to get permission from their families, right? Yeah, when I did the novel, each chapter had a had a a print from each of the the photographers, except for um Lee Miller's and that one I used a print from Man Ray. Um, but for using the prints, I needed to get in touch with families and get permission for that, uh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. was really, you know, which I understand, of course. But the rest of it is already things that are printed. I mean, it's kind of a fair use thing. And I don't, um, I don't libel anybody. You know what I mean? It's not like I, I, I say, oh, well, and, you know, I think that they were a child molester. You know, I don't, I don't anything like that. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm always hoping that if the, if anyone in the family reads any of this, that they will understand that it's just another way of putting that person out there for mm -hmm. people to love and find, you know, and, and not to feel, you know, that I'm that I'm doing something and and really a lot of the some of the people that control the archives are really wonderful some of them are a little rough <laughs> you know um but Always. and with Mamie Vonda her archive ended up in very weird hands but someone like um Tina Modati at least up until a few years ago was considered she's a rights orphan um so they all have like sort of a, a different you know, a different thing going on. There is a research question here too, like how did you research their lives? Did you read books and interviews? Can you tell people who don't know what archival research is? Can you quickly tell them? Oh, well, with archival research, usually you have to get permission to, you know, from whoever controls the archive. The archive usually will have, say, say images and or writings or letters, you know, things like that. And you need to get permission for that. Um, and, um, when you're, well, years ago in the 90s, I wrote a book called The Passion Dream Book. And The Passion Dream Book, um, a lot of it took place in the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance is a big uh, interest of mine going back to the early 90s and actually a little bit before. And um, one of the characters in there was sort of based, but really, really, really loosely on um, James Vandersee, who was a Harlem um, photographer. and I ended up talking to his third wife. We ended up calling because I wanted to do this slideshow at that time, doing it with a Kodak carousel. And I wanted to use some of the images, but I wasn't sure if I could. So I thought, well, let me just check and make sure, even though I'm just have this Kodak carousel and even though it's a novel, I'm not doing anything else, but it was great talking to her. And she was wonderful. I mean, she was really great about um, giving me permission and, and everything. Um, sometimes, like I said, sometimes people aren't, it, it just really, it really depends. And, and so when you do the research, you do con, you can contact an archive, but usually um, if you see an image, yeah, you'll contact the archive and you'll say, you know, can I use it? But that's different than if I was going into the archive to look for something, I already know what I want, so. Man, I'm glad we've met each other in our lives right now at these particular ages, which has nothing to do with anything. I just wanted to say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get married, so, you know. <laughs> Clearly. Um, there is one, which writers inspired you to become an author? I'll just direct it at you. Oh, God. It depends on what age I am. <laughs> oh, uh, that's a good answer. I agree with that. Like yeah. 20s, it would have been a certain kind of author. In my 30s, it was a whole different set of authors. 40s, yeah. 50s, like it's changed. It's really changed. Yeah, I think that, I mean, you know, there were a lot of kids books I read. One was, of course, Harriet the Spy, which most kids read. And that really is a, the training ground for being a writer. It's like, go to your neighborhood, spy on your neighbors, 
write about them. <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll do that. <laughs> I may have taken that a little too far. <laughs> yeah. Go in their house, take their shit. Exactly. <laughs> Don't get permission. Um, and, and then when I was in my 20s, I discovered Alice Adams, who wrote short stories and novels. And Alice Adams was a funny situation in that she wasn't my favorite writer and I don't think she's even the best writer but she really really influenced me that just for and I think that's another thing that people don't realize with writers is there can be something that you think no it's not my favorite no it's not great but it but it really unlocks something for you you know it's just a it's it's a you never know where that key is no I mean um so this is blasphemous to say, but I'll say it anyway. Um, Jane Goodall is not a great writer, but Jane Goodall's writing is one of the reasons I became a writer. I was, um, her primate research just, it was the thing, it did it for me. And it was storytelling to me. And from then on, I'm like, I wish Jane Goodall was both my mother and God. I <laughs> know, she's great. I've seen her twice. I saw her once in the seventies and she was great. But I agree with you. I, I understand what you mean. It, and there is something about that observation and creating a narrative. And yeah. she does that beautifully, you know, yeah. even though she's not a great writer, but yeah. But she can translate a kind of high form of science into storytelling for the rest of us. And I suspect that's part of it. Yeah. My favorite writers do that, including you. They translate complex emotions and images and experiences into a language that we feel like we can be part of. Um, well, I have to ask you because that's just how it is. Um, do you know what your next project is or are you trying not to think about it? <laughs> oh my God. So I started this book. I think it's, it'll be five years ago this summer. I, and I am still on page like 35. <laughs> I even know the whole book. I know where it goes. I know what happens. And it's just, it's, <laughs> it just, it languishes and I don't know why. And I keep thinking, there's something I need. And every once in a while I stumble on a piece of it. And I think, oh yeah, that's it. And so who knows? <laughs> fiction or nonfiction or neither or both? Like little short book. And it's basically two people who are stuck in a room for a night. And that's all it is. And, um, um, but I keep, I keep playing with it and it, it keeps like not playing with me. So <laughs> Do you think it matters how long or short any individual book project takes? Do you think that matters? You know, I don't know. I mean, it's funny. Sometimes I think the thing that takes a long time is just a thing that you shouldn't be writing. You're just, you're just hanging on to it like a blanket for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then other things will, they come to you and you think, oh yeah. Or you think, well, you know what? That's my real book. I'm just gonna write this one in the meantime, but. <laughs> You know, and that becomes like the better book because, um, and it's very hard when you have a, you know, an idea and you want to, you want to do that thing. I mean, I have a, a, a quote in this book from Don Powell, where she says, you know, basically every day she avoids writing and she said, you know, what is it? Is it that I fear it's not the masterpiece I planned, you know, and it's always perfect before you start writing. So to get into it and write always feels like, ugh. <laughs> You know. Wow, that's a great, we're getting close to ending. That's a great quote to kind of both think about and also go cry about. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you working on something? Always, always. But I'm in the category of person, and maybe you are too, I don't know, um, where if I'm not writing, I'm my worst self, and I'm a little bit, yeah. you know, off the rails. And so writing helps me. Um, drink less, pay less for therapy, and take less prescription medications. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be writing, even if it doesn't turn into something, you know, for out there in the world, yeah. um, it keeps me from being a icky person. Oh my God, I completely understand. It keeps me from breaking into the neighbor's house. You can quote me. On <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm going to say that. <laughs> I'm going to start using that. It keeps me from breaking yeah, into the neighbor's house. Sure. <laughs> Well, you guys, do you have anything else? Let me do a quick, quick thing. Oh, they all love you. They love you. <laughs> that, that's good. Uh, Backfield Feminist needs to be on a t-shirt, Terry Tholen says. Who's, <laughs> I love you, Terry. Um, 
it's always perfect before you start writing. Yeah, they like that quote a lot. Um, anything else you want to tell them before they escape away from us? Oh, just have a good dinner. And, uh, and, and what I want to tell them is, thank you, Lydia. Thank you so much for, for doing this with me. You are a doll. And thank all of you for coming. And thank you, Kim and Kevin. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event. It was so wonderful to host you, Whitney and Lydia. Thanks too to our audience for tuning in tonight. Please consider purchasing a copy of Whitney's new book at pals.com and check out our lineup of upcoming events while you're there. We look forward to seeing you at another one of our events again very soon. Whitney, Lydia, thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.